Mm -hmm. I need to. I welcome all of you back to the session three. Yeah. What you. Can you do with wisdom to deal with uh, stress and anxiety in the modern world? Uh, we've had uh, kind of a small number the last two sessions, and I, I would attribute that to I think uh, the timing is is somewhat uh, difficult for a lot of people during the lunch hour. So we're we're going to try to to remedy that. And the next class that I'm teaching on on Passover in March, we're gonna do it at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays. So we, uh, we hope that'll bring out a few more people. Uh, also, the, the, the week break probably might have uh, interrupted the continuity a little bit, but uh, you're here and we're gonna have a, a full class session and uh, we'll proceed with our, with our learning on uh, Jewish wisdom. I thought it would be useful to, to start out uh, with, uh, with kind of a review of, of the concepts that we've studied uh, so far. And, and in a minute, I'm gonna ask Paulette to, uh, to flash those up on the screen, but I, I wanted just to address a little bit about what happened last weekend in the Jewish world in Colleyville, Texas, as we all know, uh, there was a terrorist attack at the synagogue in Colleyville. And uh, you, know, you talk about stress and anxiety in our lives. You know, as, as Jews in particular, you know, we deal with a lot of stress uh, just just because of our faith and uh, and the people that we're connected with, you know, if you're in, if you're in Israel, there's a constant threat of terrorist attack, and uh, and now uh, unfortunately we joined our co-religionists uh, across the pond, to speak, because now we have that here. But there's a saying in Yiddish called "shver uh, bisain yid." It's hard to be a Jew, and uh, and and there, that phrase has many layers of meaning, but. Uh, in particular, it, it has to do with the stress and anxiety involved now with just going to synagogue to pray. You know, we have to be looking over our shoulder constantly, you know, to make sure that we're safe. And that, too, is a source of, of stress and anxiety. So uh, the modern world has definitely presented uh, unique challenges to, uh, to being Jewish. But we're, the focus of this class, of course, is on uh, stress and anxiety in our everyday lives. So we're gonna begin by uh, flashing up the uh, concepts that we've studied so far uh, in this course. And I'm sure if you would like a, a copy of these uh, concepts that we've gone over, that uh, Paulette would be able to get that to you or we'll, we'll figure out a way to get that to you so you can keep a, uh, you know, a record of what we've discussed in case you wanna go back to it uh, in the future. Because uh, you know, if something's written down, you're gonna be more likely to, uh, memorize, to remember it and to refer to it. So let's begin. Okay, Paulette, let's put the, some of those things up on the screen, please. All right. Um, the first concept we talked about uh, was Mitzrayim. And I'm just going to read through the description here. The Hebrew word for the country of Egypt, where the Israelites suffered over 400 years of slavery. The literal meaning of Mitzrayim is narrow places or narrow straits, which takes the idea of slavery to a symbolic level. Each of us has a personal Mitzrayim, our own narrow straits that restrict us, stifle us, trap us. These internal chains of self-imposed slavery, our own negative thoughts and restrictive beliefs might be what's making us afraid what's keeping us from moving forward on the path to a productive and fulfilling life. But now it's time to break the chains that keep us shackled so we can truly be free from the fear and anxiety that plagues us. So this is the, the, the whole idea that, that we each are restricted by the narrow places, the Mitzrayim that we each impose upon ourselves, a, a lot of which comes from our own negative thinking. Uh, sometimes, you know, the stress and anxiety is from actual external sources, but a lot of it is internal because of our own uh, thinking about things and uh, what's happened to us in the past. And we allow that to uh, kind of uh, percolate in our hearts and minds, and it's hard to get rid of. So a lot of the, the damage we do to ourselves from uh, stress and anxiety comes from the way that, that we think and that we approach the world. 
All right. And, and at any time, if you want to add a comment or you have a question, uh, please, you know, uh, raise your hand and let us know. And Paula will recognize you and, and you can uh, you can talk, especially in a smaller group. You know, we really have more opportunity for uh, for interaction. And, um, and and I don't want to be talking at you the whole hour. I, I'd much prefer you know, an interactive session. Uh, I think the last session I, I shared some personal struggles that I have. And uh, if you would care to do so, uh, that would enrich our conversation. All right, let's move on to the second concept. Neshama, the Hebrew word for soul. Neshama also means breath, which is consistent with the Torah's description of the creation of humankind, that God blew the breath of life into the body, making it a living being. Never underestimate the power of the breath to relieve stress and anxiety. Being conscious of one's breath is the gateway to the soul. Your soul is, so let's stop there. Just, uh, you know, we talked about just how deep breathing can really be used to reduce stress and anxiety and, uh, and put us in somewhat of a meditative state, relaxing us, and, and it really does work. And it's very much connected to the soul because they're based on the same Hebrew word. All right. Being conscious of one's breath is the gateway to the soul. Your soul is what makes you, you. Your neshama is your essence, your unique, eternal, beautiful self. And we talked about that in the last session. I read to you an excerpt from uh, Harold Kushner, who uh, really gave a beautiful explanation of how we are more than just our body. Uh, the essence of who we are, we're more than just flesh and bones. The essence of who we are, our personality, our character, our values, it, it comes from our neshama, our soul, deep down in the kishkas. To nurture your precious soul, you must look past the superficial aspects of daily life and find your inner light, that special spark, which is the nucleus of the soul. This spark is nothing less than the human impulse to find hope and optimism in spite of the vicissitudes and vagaries of life which bombard us almost on a daily basis. The time to find your inner light is now. And uh, this really gets at the idea that, uh, you know, how, how, given the events that happen to us, we can, it, it's, it's not what happens to us, it's how we respond to them. And, and two different people will see the same event. One could see it extremely negatively and the other could focus a positive light on that. So that spark, that, op, that ability to find some bit of hope or optimism, some way out of anything that happens to us is, is very important. And that spark is nothing less than the soul, the neshama, that, uh, that gives us hope that no matter what happens, there will be a brighter day. Uh, hope is really one of the key values of Judaism. And uh, there's a great saying, that uh, you can live without food for uh, three weeks, live without water for three days, but you can't live without hope for three minutes. Such... Rabbi, we have someone who's raising their hand for a comment. Yes. yes. So, for, so I, uh, this is Ira. Okay. Um, a few years ago, I took a yoga meditation course it was actually an intense three-day course and the whole three days was only about breathing and breathing techniques needless to say after three days i was wiped out but it's fascinating that that concept that yoga concept of breath and intake of breath and how to do it and different types of breathing so relates to this mm -hmm. absolutely you know the, the whole the foundation of yoga is is the breath and that's the first thing that they try to teach is how we can utilize the breath being conscious of our breath as as a relaxation technique so that yes it's very important matter of fact when i was in the institute of jewish spirituality's rabbinic cohort program and we had four uh retreats four five-day retreats a lot of the, at least two hours each day was spent uh, meditating and and just breathing uh, so it was very much and we had an actual a session of yoga as well so the, you know it all ties in you know Jewish spirituality yoga 
uh, the breath. It, it, it's all very much a, a part of our religion. And, and I think probably all religions have some importance placed on, on the breath and, and breathing. So thank you for that. Okay, let's move on to the third concept. Betul, a Hebrew word that means self-nullification or nothingness. Betul is the spiritual practice of internal reflection in which one empties oneself of ego and purely selfish thoughts in order to connect with the needs of others. When one's immediate concerns move away from a preoccupation with the self towards a focus on helping others, inner stress and anxiety melt away. Betul is not self-annihilation. On the contrary, it is a state of transcendence, which involves filling yourself with meaningful thoughts and actions to lift you up beyond an egocentric focus to a more altruistic state of mind. Even when we have the power and authority to take up all the space, we should utilize the concept of betul to nullify ourselves to make space for others space for others to express their own individual voices, feelings, emotions, and ideas, space for others to shine. The space we create around us should be free of judgment and ego. Taking up less space allows us to help others to grow and ourselves to grow as well by learning humility and compassion. Remember the teaching of Ani, Ain, and the tale of two pockets, so you can find your true purpose in making life a little better for people less fortunate than you. Now, there, there's, a, there's a lot going on here with this concept of betul. And, you know, ordinarily, we, we think about how, how in the world can uh, nullifying ourselves create an opportunity to have a better relationship with others. And, uh, and if you think about it, you know, so often, you know, we live in a culture that strives uh, to get us to tell what's special about us, what makes us uh, ahead above the crowd, how are we different, how are we special. As a matter of fact, when you write a resume, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to say, what makes you better than everyone else? Um, when you're when you're when we're in a group of people, it, it can be a social situation. Uh, sometimes we don't listen quite carefully to what others are saying because we're we're so concerned about you know what are we going to say in response. When we're in a group, we're thinking about how can we shine so we can stand out in this crowd, rather than uh, allowing other people to shine. Uh, you know what's what's attractive to other people? Is it is it seeing someone uh, you know say, look at me, I'm the greatest, I'm the best, I'm very I'm special, or is it someone who really listens and has the confidence to say, uh, you know, I I believe in myself enough that I want to know what's special about you, and by making space for others, I mean that's the best gift you can give to someone else, and having a positive relationship is is allowing them to shine allowing them to say what's special about them, the ability to listen uh, and, and to be present for someone else. And, and the author goes into this in, 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 in a number of ways. Uh, she talks about how when she got married, she had a vision of what the marriage should be like, and, and she tried to you know, control everything. And her husband had his own vision of what he wanted, and they just, they couldn't, the minds could not meet. And it, and it took, they each had to nullify their own needs, wishes, and desires to make space for what the other, for what their partner wanted. And then, only then did the marriage really work. So it, it's the whole idea of making space for others. You know, when, when a child comes to you with a problem, uh, you're, you're, when your children were, were young and they had problems, did you give them advice based on your own experience or did you try to, to look at it from their point of view? You know, sometimes we, we, we just we, we give our own experiences that may or may not be relatable to the person we're talking to. So it's, it's all about lessening the ego to make space for others. And if you remember the teaching of Ani Ain, Ani means I in Hebrew. But if you just switch two of the letters around, you get the word Ain, which means nothingness. 
So nothingness is really and the obverse side of the ego, the I. In order to really establish a connection with someone, we have to attain that state of nothingness to make space for the other person. And then my favorite teaching, the tale of two pockets. In one pocket, we should have a piece of paper that says, for my sake, the world was created. And in the other pocket, I am but dust and ashes. That way, when we become too haughty and, and that we think too much of ourselves, we pull out the piece of paper that says, I am but dust and ashes to remind us that we should have a sense of humility and not think that we're the be all and end all of existence and the most important thing in the universe and, and the center of all uh, of everything. And when we're feeling low, have a sense of, of lack of self-esteem or confidence, you pull out the other piece of paper that says, for my sake, the world was created to remember that, that we, we are important uh, in the world and that we have an, uh, an opportunity to affect uh, change in the world by, by how we act. So that's a great teaching, this tale of two pockets. And, um, and I wanna connect these two ideas of, uh, of, of making space for others. And then what we discussed previously with the, the light, the inner spark. Uh, this is one of my favorite little uh, excerpts it's from a book by Robert Fulgham. Uh, the book, uh, it was on fire when I lay down on it. Let me just read this to you. Um, okay. By the time I came to the Institute for a summer session, Alexander Papaderos had become a living legend. One look at him and you saw his strength and intensity, energy, physical power, courage, intelligence, passion, and vivacity radiated from his person. And to speak to him, to shake his hand, to be in a room with him when he spoke, was to experience his extraordinary electric humanity. Few men can live up to their reputations when you get close. Alexander Papaderos was an exception. At the last session on the last morning of a two week seminar on Greek culture, led by intellectuals and experts in their field who were recruited by Papaderos from across Greece, Papaderos rose from his chair at the back of the room and walked to the front, where he stood in the bright Greek sunlight of an open window and looked out. We followed his gaze across the bay to the iron cross marking the German cemetery. He turned and made the ritual gesture, are there any questions? Quiet quilted the room. These two weeks had generated enough questions for a lifetime, but for now there was only silence. No questions, Papaderos swept the room with his eyes. So I asked, Dr. Papaderos, what is the meaning of life? The usual laughter followed and people stirred to go. Papaderos held up his hand and stilled the room and looked at me for a long time, asking with his eyes if I was serious and seeing from my eyes that I was. I will answer your question. Taking his wallet out of his hip pocket, he fished into a leather billfold and brought out a very small round mirror about the size of a quarter. And what he said went like this. When I was a small child during the war, we were very poor and we lived in a remote village. One day on the road, I found the broken pieces of a mirror. A German motorcycle had been wrecked in that place. I tried to find all the pieces and put them together, but it was not possible. So I kept only the largest piece, this one. And by scratching it on a stone, I made it round. I began to play with it as a toy and became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect light into dark places where the sun would never shine, in deep holes and crevices and dark closets. It became a game for me to get light into the most inaccessible places I could find. I kept the little mirror, and as I went about my growing up, I would take it out in idle moments and continue the challenge of the game. As I became a man, I grew to understand that this was not just a child's game, but a metaphor for what I might do with my life. I came to understand that I am not the light or the source of light, but light, truth, understanding, knowledge is there, and it will only shine in many dark places if I reflect it. I am a fragment of a mirror whose whole design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, I can reflect light into the dark places of this world, into the black places in the hearts of men, and change some things in some people. 
Perhaps others may see and do likewise. This is what I am about. This is the meaning of my life. And then he took this, his small mirror and holding it carefully, caught the bright rays of daylight streaming through the window and reflected them onto my face and onto my hands folded on the desk. Much of what I experienced in the way of information about Greek culture and history that summer is gone from memory. But in the wallet of my mind, I carry around a small round mirror still. Are there any questions? And I, I love this excerpt. And I, I, I always think about it because we are like that mirror. And using our inner light, the spark we each have implanted within us, we can, if we contract our egos enough to help other people, we can reflect light into the darkest of places. That can be our true purpose. All right, I see, do we have the next one on here? Is that what, is that the fourth one? Paulette? Let's go back, let's go back. Rabbi Muller? Yes. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, it's Sandy Parker. Can you, what is this book? It was on fire when I lay down on it. Can you just say more about what kind of book that is? Yes, it's by Robert Fulgham, author of All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. He was very popular uh, I don't know, about 30, 40 years ago. He wrote a series of, of books on, on just uh, everyday wisdom. And this book is, it was on fire when I laid down on it. And the excerpt is towards the back of the book in the, in the paperback uh, uh, pages 170, about 170 to 175. So is it like philosophy or everyday wisdom or what, what is it meant to be? Everyday wisdom. Okay, great, thanks. All, all of his books. You know, every, most people have heard of his famous one, uh, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. <laughs> And his, his name is spelled F-U-L-G-H-U-M, Fulgham. Okay, Paula, let's go back one. Did we skip one or is this the next one? Okay, all right, all right. So let's let's move on now to the next. After Betul, we have Tsum Tsum. Now this, this is gonna, you know, in, in the book, the author really didn't, she didn't distinguish between these two ideas very much. And you, you'll see what I mean in just a second, but, but I did. All right, the, word, the Hebrew word for contraction or concealment. In the Kabbalah of Jewish mysticism, simtsum is used to describe how God created the world. Simtsum is an incredibly holy and complex concept because it, descri it describes the process in which God made space for us, God's divine creations. God contracted and concealed a part of God's eternal light to make space for God's creations, the world and us. By the same token, we need to corral our own ego in order to make room for God so we can connect with a higher reality. Use the concept of tsimtsum to contract yourself. Remember that you are not the center of the universe, the be all and end all of existence that not everything is about you. Remember the first of the 10 commandments, paraphrased, I'm God, you're not. All right, that's really what the first commandment is. It's not really a commandment, it's a statement. I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's not, a com that's not commanding us to do anything. It's saying that I'm God, you're not God. So just keep that in mind. That's what God is telling us. Use your newly found faith in God to help you overcome fear and despair. The book of Psalms is a testament to the power of God and an indispensable resource to help you overcome fear and despair. You will realize that with God at your side, you are never alone in facing the trials of life for God is always there for you. So let's go back now and, and I, just, I wanna flesh out this idea of Tsim Tsun. Uh, God's contraction to make room for us. And this is a legend that goes back to, uh, to the Kabbalah of Jewish mysticism. And it, it's the whole notion that in the beginning, there was only God's light 
and it filled the entire universe. God was called the, the, uh, the Or Ein Sof, the light of which is endless. In order to make room for the world and for human beings and for animals and plants and the moon and the sun and the stars, God had to contract. Uh, and I, I don't like to use the word himself because I don't like to refer to God as, as in gender, but it, uh, it sounds funny to say God's self. So you know what I mean when I say himself, I, I, I'm really referring to God as a non-gendered entity. But God had to contract himself to make space for us. So how did he do that? All right, imagine just one entire space filled with light. Take a point in the center, pretend like you're using a pencil point, and you put it in the center, and then that pencil point enlarges and, until there is a visible black hole, a black space in the center. And so God contracted himself and made the void, the black space, larger and larger in the center until there was room for the creation of the world. Now, the best analogy I can give you in terms of, of science is one from astronomy. And um, we all know what a, a solar eclipse is. And a, a total solar eclipse, of course, is when the moon comes perfectly between the sun and the earth and the moon blocks out the sun because it's, the moon is much closer to earth and therefore it can block out the much larger sun, which is behind it. Now, when now it, it's not the analogy is not a total solar eclipse, but what's called an annular solar eclipse, which means that it's not a total eclipse, but it's only it's it's a partial eclipse with the light just representing kind of like a ring of fire around the edge, and then that this is when the moon covers a good portion of the sun in the center but you can still see the ring of light around the edge. And that's, that's the best example of, of how I can tell you about Simpson when God contracted himself, created the black void in the middle, but there was still light on the edges and then the world could be created. But this, this whole idea of contraction or concealment is what, what we have to do in order to make space for God. God made space for us but we have to make space for God. So often in our modern culture, God plays such a little role, especially in a COVID environment where so many people are dying unjustly and we question, is there even a God at all? You know, this, this whole uh, uh, pandemic has really, uh, you know, God has taken a big hit in terms of, of people who really question what, what is God's role in the world if, if this unjust thing is happening. But we have to remember that we don't know all the answers. We are not God. And we, we still are able to use God as, a, as a, a resource to help us get through difficult times. And we started to do that two weeks ago when we took a look at certain texts from the book of Psalms that's saying, what, what harm can others do to me uh, when compared to the power of God? And, and the book of Psalms is chock full of prayers that tell us that God is always there for us, even though at times uh, we, we, we tend to feel God's absence more than God's presence based on what happens in the world. But God is, is still always there for us, and we don't need to fear. If you look at the last stanza in the popular concluding hymn of Shabbat, Adon Olam, uh, you know, God says, God is there for us. I shall not fear for God is always with me. Day and night, I will trust in the Lord. And, and, and that is, is a, the whole book of Psalms contains that type of, of wisdom for us to, to achieve. Um, if you recall, we started to go through uh, the prayers in, in the Amida. And uh, the first three deal with God's power. But I just, I wanted just to read you a little, a uh, few things that amplify the points I am making. Stress is often accompanied by contraction of both mind and body. See, we, we don't normally think of contracting ourselves as something that's positive. You know, when we're stressed, when we're feeling anxious, we suffer a constriction of body and mind. 
a narrowing, if you will. And um, being overwhelmed by too many demands creates a tightness in the shoulders or a clutching in the chest that then constricts breathing. Thoughts of gloom and doom are often accompanied by knots in the stomach. We shut down. We focus solely on our individual predicaments. Our vision gets very narrow. So we don't think of contracting ourselves as something that's positive, but it is when you think of it in the context of Tsim Tsum. It may help to speak gently to ourselves at these moments and remind ourselves that we are doing our best, that we are only human, and that we are part of a reality that is much greater and wiser than we can imagine. The biblical prophet Isaiah contemplates creation in amazement and asks, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and gauged the skies with the span and weighed the mountains with a scale and the hills with a balance? That's kind of what God said to Job. You know, where were you when I created the heavens and the waters? So you know, it's the whole idea of, of, you know, you think you know everything and how the universe works. Well, you don't because you have no idea how I, as the great power of the universe, uh, works behind the scenes. Suddenly our attention moves outside our own limited reality. We are face to face with the divine in divinity's immensity and grandeur. All right, uh, let me read to you a little more. Um, one more idea here. Remember you are not alone. One of God's first pronouncements in Genesis is it is good, it is not good for a human being to be alone. We all need the company of others to feel seen and known in close relationships. Loneliness and isolation can exacerbate stress. Judaism teaches that we are never alone. No matter how separate we feel at a given moment, we can turn our hearts toward Ribono Shalom, the master of the universe, meaning God, the power beneath and beyond, yet so near to us, the source of all life, the energy that fills the universe, the presence that guides our steps, the unchanging truth that sustains us amid all the changes of life. So part of the way that we deal with stress and anxiety, again, is to be aware that we're never alone, that God is with us, God is on our side, even though uh, the evidence around us may not uh, point to that. But, but that's something, I believe that, and I believe that, that God protects me, even though logically, uh, God obviously doesn't protect everyone, but, you know, it, it's, it's not really a rational type of idea that we can logically deduce, but I, in my deepest recesses of the soul, believe that God is there for me. And I hope that you believe God is there for you as well, because it offers tremendous encouragement, especially when you're living on your own. Okay, so this is the idea of Tsim Tsum, is that all of us can do better to make more room for God in our lives to recognize the power of God to help us deal with stress and anxiety. Now in the book, the author really did not distinguish much between Betul, self-nullification, and this idea of Tsim Tsum. She kind of really made it two sides of the same coin, almost like the obverse of each other. But so I, I kind of fleshed it out a little bit to say that Betul really is more about making space for other people. Tsim Tsum is more about making space for God. So I, they're, they're really two different ideas here, but I think both both very helpful. All right, um, any questions about Tsim Tsum? It's a very, it's a kind of a nebulous concept to understand, but it's so very powerful and uh, spirituality and holiness in it. You know, the idea that God shrunk himself down to make room for us and how we can take from that example uh, to shrink ourselves. So we have room for, for God in our lives. Any, any questions, anything you'd like to share about your doubts about God's existence? I mean, we could probably spend a whole nother class just talking about that. Rabbi, uh, we have someone holding their hand up. Okay, who is that? Bert. Okay, hi Bert. Yeah, well, one of the concepts of Judaism and how does it fit into letting God be part of your day or your space or whatever, is the Orthodox pray, I don't know how many times a day, but it's a withdrawal from reality to just focus on, on God in prayer. So anyway, I would think that is definitely an anxiety reducer in most situations. Yeah, yes, absolutely. 
um, and, and, and the, the Orthodox pray three times a day. Uh, it's also, you know, it's, it's another idea as well that we that comes from the Amida, the, the prayer of thanksgiving, the prayer of gratitude. You know, prayer helps us to be grateful for, for, for the good that's in our lives. And that's another way to reduce uh, stress and anxiety by having a, a good measure of gratitude. Um, but yeah, I, I say that, you know, when you immerse yourself in that world, you know, and, you know, what, what are the, um, uh, what are, what are the, uh, um, the Lubavitchers do in, 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 in Eastern Parkway in, in New York in Crown Heights? They, they cut themselves off from the world and they live in their own reality enclave. Uh, so I guess I'm sure that reduces stress too because they just they focus in on their own world. The Amish do that as well. Uh, and it's a way of sheltering yourself from, uh, from everything that goes on around you. Okay. And I have one other thing that I do and I find pleasure in doing it. Uh, very often, even at the checkout counter at the grocery store or when I'm engaged with people, I specifically ask, how is your day going? And it's amazing. Some people are very willing to share a lot. And uh, I follow it up with a smile because everybody likes a smile. Yes, that's, that's wonderful. And that, that, that gets into something else I wanted to bring up about making space for others. Um, uh, the famous philosopher, Jewish philosopher, Martin Buber, created the concepts of I, it, and I, thou. Uh, I, it is when you relate to other people uh, by means of what they can do for you. So uh, when you check out at a grocery store, you really, you know, basically they're, they're there to check out your items. You pay for it, you leave. Uh, you don't, it's the very rare person who says, hi, how are you doing? How's your day? You know, to look at that person, not just as an it there to, to check us out at the counter, but to, to treat them as a vow, as a, as a real human being, as a real person, and to acknowledge that, you know, they exist. So, you know, Buber's whole, uh, uh, you know, Buber's main, uh, main book, uh, uh, I Vow, or his, his main philosophy, uh, it, 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 and Buber is the only Jewish philosopher that you'll find in general philosophy courses in college. But it was a great contribution to the idea of, of, of uh, really just the, the corpus of human relationships, how to relate to people. Try to treat others as a thou and not just as an it. Uh, we, can, we can treat uh, acquaintances as a thou and we can also treat close pe people close to us as an it if we're not careful you know we can it's easy to slip into i it relationships with friends family members relatives loved ones if we really aren't there for them if we don't make enough space for them if it's all about us and we don't really see the other person we it's a, it's it's, it's uh, there's a potential danger to turn the people who we should be having i thou relationships with into i it and Buber recalls a story where a young man came to him who was distraught and, uh, and he poured his heart out to Buber. And Buber was too concerned with the latest book project he was working on. And he really didn't pay attention to the young man, basically treated him as an it instead of a thou. And later on, that, man, that young man committed suicide. And Buber never got over the guilt that he wasn't there for that person, that he didn't make enough space to really hear the troubles that that young man was expressing. So when you know when, when you when you mentioned checking out at the grocery store, Bert, that that concept all came back to me about Uber, and and how you know we need to to contract ourselves enough to recognize the humanity of, of other people, even people who are there to provide service for us, whether it's the the the, the bellman at a hotel or the doorman somewhere or or the checkout counter or the teller at the bank or the post the postal worker just to be able to say how are you how's your day going that means so much to them i mean when when uh, when the garbage guy comes to collect the, the trash I, I will wave to him and he waves back and he's probably thinking boy that's that was nice to do and you know try to do that it doesn't cost anything okay any other comments let's move on to the next one this phrase literally means a very narrow bridge. It is taken from a well-known song based on the words of Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlav, grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, who was the, the founder of uh, Jewish mysticism. 
The whole world is a very narrow bridge, but the main thing is not to be afraid. And the author describes a time where she over, she was walking to uh, she was walking home from work on Friday afternoon, and this was in London. And she heard some Orthodox young men singing the song as they were preparing to celebrate Shabbat. And she had it reminded her of this when she heard this song growing up in Israel. And, uh, and she thought about the meaning of it and it changed her life. The whole world is a very narrow bridge, but the main thing is not to be afraid. You know, so many things that we're, you know, that we're afraid to do that cause us anxiety, uh, that paralyze us. This song tells us that yes, it's, it's a narrow bridge to cross, but all we have to do is make the first step forward, not get stuck, not to be paralyzed by our fear, but always to move forward, never to get stuck. Let me continue. The song encourages you to have no fear at all, despite the dangers that may lurk ahead. We must try to take that first step onto our narrow bridge, whatever it may be. We must always move forward if we want to conquer our fears. Sometimes fear can be paralyzing, but we must have the courage to power through it. And I, I put in here Saving Private Ryan because I'm in trying to think of an example of where a paralysis, you know, fear can be so paralyzing that you are unable to act. I, I, for those of you who've seen Save it, Saving Private Ryan, I mean, it's a vicious war movie. It's one of the most graphic I have ever seen. And there's one scene towards the end of the film uh, when the Germans move in with their tanks to take over a town uh, being defended by the Americans. And it leads to hand-to-hand -hand combat between a German soldier and a, they, and a young American, actually a Jewish American soldier. And they, 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 they discover each other, they find each other by accident in a building. And then they engage into hand-to-hand -hand combat. And uh, it's, a, it's a frighteningly horrible scene. The German has a knife and he, he kills the American. And um, on his way out of the building, he's walking down the steps and he uh, and there is uh, there's an Amer another American soldier who really has dealt with uh, fear of he can't he's really uh, unable to shoot a gun to do anything he's um, he's frightened of, of it he's unable to participate in the war effort and he and and this and he knows what happened he heard, he overheard the struggle he he overheard the American crying out for help saying shoot him shoot him. And he just stood in the stairwell and he was so paralyzed by his fear, he was unable to move. And the German soldier walked past him. He, he only had a knife. The other guy had a gun. The other German soldier walked by him, didn't even harm him because he knew he was useless. And he just shook his head and walked on. And this young man just was able to, unable to even move, so paralyzed by his fear. And it, it's such a powerful scene and it, uh, it, it doesn't really leave you. But then by the end of the film, he got his courage back and, and, he, and he was able to take German prisoners and he held them at gunpoint and, and he, he somehow was able to get his courage. But when I, when I think of how fear, how paralyzing fear can be, where it stops us in our tracks, I think of that example from that film. Okay, just the action of taking a single step may be enough to change things for you. Think of Nachshon ben Aminadab. Now, if you, if, you, if you know who Nachshon ben Aminadab is, he's the guy who took the first step into the Red Sea to part the waters. He doesn't, he's not in the movie with Charlton Heston. Uh, he doesn't get described in the Torah. His story is in the Midrash, where, you know, when the waters parted, it, they didn't part by themselves. They didn't part with Moses holding up his staff. God said, take the first step, and, and nobody would. But there was Nachshon, who had the courage to walk into the water. He walked all the way up to his, you know, he, and, and his, his head was covered by water. So supposedly he should have drowned. But at that moment, when the water completely submerged his head, the sea parted. So there's actually a street in Jerusalem, in, in West Jerusalem, named after Nachshon ben Aminadab. It's right near the Hadassah Hospital and the Kennedy Memorial. I remember we were driving out there and, and I see this street, Nachshon ben Aminadab, I couldn't believe it. So they named a street after him and he deserved that, you know, if he was the only guy who had the courage to wade into the water. But that is an example of 
taking that first step forward, facing our fears. And, and they always turn out to be less than we imagine when you move forward. Okay, so think of Nachshon ben Aminadav or the Israelites in accepting the Torah. And I, I think that uh, this, this is from this week's Parsha. Uh, I, I forgot to look this up, but, but uh, the, the episode of the golden calf is, is, is coming up very shortly if it's not this, this Shabbat. And uh, of course, you know, uh, the Israelites grew impatient waiting for Moses on the mountain uh, for 40 days to come down. And uh, they figured he's not coming back. We better, we better build our own God. And so they built the golden calf. And, and what did Moses do when he came down the mountain with the tablets? He, he shattered, he, he, in anger, he shattered them because he was, he, his own uh, faith in the Israelites was shattered by their act of apostasy. So he shattered the tablets and, um, and, and um, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, wait, this is, this is a different one. Sorry, forget that. In the Israelites accepting the Torah. Okay, when God, what I just said is from, from, the, next, uh, from the next one, I'm sorry. Na'asev and is, it means we will do and we will listen. When the Israelites, uh, when, when, other, when, when God gave the Torah, is the Israelites were not the first nation to be asked. Other nations were asked and they said, what's in the Torah? And uh, I, one certain people was, it was said, well, what do you mean? No, no, no murder? We can't, we can't handle a, a Torah that doesn't allow us to murder. We don't accept the Torah. And other people was asked to, to accept the Torah and they said, what do you mean? We can't commit adultery? We're, we're not gonna accept the Torah if we can't commit adultery. And when God asked the Israelites, they accepted immediately. And not only did they accept, but they said, before they said, we will hear it, they said, we will do it, and then we'll listen to it. So the Israelites took the plunge, they moved forward before they even had time to think about it. And that's, that's not always a good thing to do. You know, we, we don't wanna rush into anything without thinking it through, but this is an example where you, sometimes you just have to take the plunge and take the first step. Na'asev nishma, we will do and we will listen. And that, that this phrase is a very important one from Torah because it's referred to often because it's a perfect example of how willing the Israelites were to accept the Torah and move forward ahead. And, and I'm sorry I mentioned that other example about the golden calf. That, that, that's coming later with a different example. We'll get to it. Um, but but I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think. So when, when the Israelites accepted Torah, which is coming up very soon in, in, in Exodus chapter 20, you'll see that verse. They were asked to accept the Torah and they said, Na'asev and Ishma. Never be afraid of failure as some of the world's greatest advances came about only from bold initiatives and the courage to go where no person had ventured before. Start by crossing smaller bridges before tackling the big ones. And this, uh, this is something interesting in the book that uh, the author mentioned. You know, she worked for um, a company for Amazon and for Google and companies that really require innovation and, and, and challenging change. And how does one go about this? Well, the greatest inventions came not from following the conventional and the tried and true, but being able to venture out on your own to go where no person had ever gone before, to be willing to fail. I mean, in order to discover something new, you have to be willing to fail because it may not work. So the, the, the corporate culture in those companies is to encourage people to put their fear of failure aside, to, to be bold enough to uh, experiment with new ideas because they may hit on the one idea that's going to change the world. And I love the phrase she came up with, uh, I think at Google or at wherever she was working, the phrase was fail harder, fail harder encourage people not to be afraid of failure because that's the only way innovation and change can occur. I remember from years ago in the 60s growing up, and I know you'll all remember this, what was the, uh, the motto from the car rental company? I guess it was, was it Hertz maybe? We try harder. You remember the, the buttons that you would wear, the white buttons with the red lettering, we try harder? How about wearing a button that says, we fail harder? Nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, there's, there's a wonderful story about Abe Lincoln 
who, you know, before he came, became president, he, he ran for public office and probably failed half a dozen times before he ever was elected to anything. But failure didn't stop him. He kept on going until he was, he was successful. And then the idea of start by crossing smaller bridges before tackling the bigger ones. You don't need to, to you know, face the biggest fears right away. Start with the small ones. Take the class that you've always wanted to take, but maybe thought, oh, I'm not really going to get much out of that. Uh, you know, go for the promotion that you think you might get, but you're not 100 percent sure. Uh, you know, start with small things that where the, the cost of failure really isn't so great and then proceed to the bigger ones. All right. Any questions or thoughts uh, about this? Everything we've we've covered. All right. Let's move on to the next one. In the last few minutes, shvira, all right? The Hebrew word for brokenness. Feeling broken is universal. Everyone feels broken in some way at some point in their lives. Brokenness is not something to be feared. It doesn't need to be fixed. Broken people should not be discarded. In fact, it is in the space between the shards of our broken hearts and our fragmented selves where we will learn and grow. The cracks are what make us us, all right? And that's, uh, that's actually the, you know, when the, there, there are cracks between the heart, but it's in the cracks that heal that make us stronger. The cracks make us more beautiful, more special, more powerful, and more whole. There is great value in broken things. The broken tablets remained inside the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. Uh, we're all broken in some way that causes you know, stress and anxiety from things that happened in our past. But feel, you know, every, and we tend to think we're the only ones who are, you know, have this brokenness inside of us. But feeling broken is universal. Every, no life is perfect. Now, my, my, I don't know how this happened. My wife claims she never got a subscription, but we, she's been getting People magazine for the last few weeks. Doesn't know how it came. And on the cover of this week's People magazine is a, a picture of Rob Lowe, the actor. And uh, the title of the article is How I Survived Hollywood. I took a quick look at it and I was intrigued by the title. No one has a perfect life, but I'm grateful for all of it. And I thought that is an encapsulation of this idea of Shvira, of brokenness, is that no one has a perfect life but the brokenness makes us who we are. It's part of us. It doesn't need to be fixed. It doesn't need to be removed from us. Matter of fact, when the author of the book uh, that we are using about uh, what would you do if you weren't afraid, Michal Oshman, uh, her therapist asked her, if I could take all the brokenness away, would you want that? And she said, no, she thought it over. It's, it's part of who I am. Think about the worst thing that's ever happened to you. And how did that affect you in the long run? I, will, I, I bet dollars to donuts it made you a stronger person. There's good that comes out of all of our brokenness. Um, this book by Steve Leader, the rabbi of Wilshire Boulevard Temple in Los Angeles, is a wonderful, wonderful book. It's called More Beautiful Than Before, How Suffering Transforms Us. It's a fabulous book. I, I used it for uh, two high holiday sermons one year. And he, he talks about when we are broken, when, we are, when we're suffering, there are three stages. First, we have to survive uh, the trauma. Second, we have to heal. Once we survive, we have to heal from the trauma. And third, there's growing that results as a result of the trauma. There's no trauma that doesn't result in some growth. It, they make us stronger. Um, they, they help us put into perspective the smaller things that really aren't so serious that happen to us. You know, when we've suffered a great loss, when we've gone through a crisis uh, in our professions or, or, or something in our personal lives that we thought are, will never be the same again. Somehow we managed to come through it. We survived our brokenness. And not only did we survive, but as the saying goes, we grew stronger from the broken places. We grew stronger from the broken places. And this is where the idea of when Moses came down the mountain and the tablets, he, he shattered the tablets when he saw the golden calf. 
But what happened to those broken tablets? They were placed in the ark with the new set of tablets. Why? Because wholeness and brokenness are two sides of the same thing. And the author refers to a saying by uh, Nachman of Bratislav, there's nothing so whole as a broken heart. There's nothing as whole as a broken heart because it makes us human and it makes us stronger. Look at the word shavira. Think of the, think of the, um, the uh, calls for the shofar every year on Rosh Hashanah. The first one, tekiah. The second one, shvarim. And what do you have when you hear the call of shvarim? Three broken notes. And I'll, I don't have a shofar with me. Do 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 do. It represents brokenness. The meaning of that shofar call. Well, first the shofar call is supposed to wake us up from our complacency to do good, to cease doing evil. The second, the shvirat, means there's brokenness in all of our lives, but we don't let it break us. It helps us to grow stronger. That's the meaning of Shavira and the idea that there's nothing that can happen to us that doesn't teach us something in the end. All right, I had a little bit more to cover today. We'll, we'll, we'll continue with this next week. So at least we, we, we put on paper the basic concepts we've covered. We're gonna do this next week, the Shabbat prayers of the Amida and continue on with a couple more concepts. If you would like to receive these uh, on paper, uh, indicate it to Paulette and we'll see what we can do to get those out to you. Does anyone have any final thoughts or questions, comments as we can finish up for today? Yes, if, if anybody wants anything that we ever share during the class, just let me know and I'll email it to you. Okay, any final thoughts? Thank you, Rabbi. All right, we have one final session next week. Uh, so I hope we'll see you then. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Have a good week, everyone. Okay, perfect. <laughs>